Now, this is truly the episode that's like being at my home, because I ran up and said hi to everybody, came back down out of breath. All right, so when we last left you before commercial break, telling you how things went, Celebrity Family Feud, setting the stage. Then it came time, Tam Fam, for me to learn who my adversary, my nemesis, the person I would face off again. I don't know how they pick these things, but they pick the right one. He's known as one of the most electrifying, trash-talking, straight-shooting sports journalists in the country. He's a guy that hates to lose, so when he saw my face, you know he was worried. Take a look at who I faced off against. History says the Miami Heat up 3-1 in the postseason, 14 in all time. History says the New York Knicks down 3-1 in the postseason, 0-14 all time. This is not just a chance to change history. It's a yes. chance to make history. What you gonna do? <laughs> yes, Stephen A. Smith, the king of ESPN. And his family. So Stephen's two sisters, Abigail, Carmen, her fiance, Darren, and his niece, Tamaya, they could not have been lovelier. The ladies in the family couldn't have been lovelier. <laughs> I sound like Stephen A now. Couldn't have been lovelier. <laughs> Stephen A? Hmm. <laughs> so here's the deal. Stephen A is the youngest in his family. His sisters told me he was spoiled rotten from day one. <laughs> and even as a child, apparently he dressed in suits. Steven is a native son of Queens, a New York Times best-selling author, and an actor. He's got a reoccurring role on General Hospital playing Brick, my boss, Sonny Carrizo's right-hand man. And it was on the set of GH where we caught up with him hanging out outside of Pozzolio's. Am I saying that right? The restaurant? Take a look. Mr. Smith, come on over here. I don't have any coffee, <laughs> but this is your house. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you so much. Oh, my Appreciate gosh. It. Thank you yes. for letting me come on set. One of the, the many jobs that you are holding down these days. Yes. Yes, it is true, but I love doing it. Your versatility mm -hmm. from the show that you do to writing, all of it, but this I didn't see coming. Neither did I. Uh, I made a cameo appearance in like 2007. I remember. And it was like some 10 second stuff where I had one line, they pushed me out the way and that was it. And then I was on my show first take on ESPN talking about what a big time soap opera fan I am. And you know, the folks on there were teasing me about it. And the executive producer for General Hospital, Frank Valentini was watching it. And the next thing I know, I received an invitation to come and do a scene with Maurice Bernard, who yes. plays Sonny Corinthos. Of course, a friend of ours. And uh, the next thing I know, Frank Valentini came running down the stairs, and he says, do you have time to do this? Wait. I said, what do you mean? He says, we want to make this a recurring role for you. Any luck with the phone? Still trying to dig out data. Um, they lift some prints from it, though. And? The guy's not from any registry I can access. He was a ghost. What about the weapon? It's been modified, probably by the shooter. I can tell you the original manufacturer, but there's no serial numbers. It's untraceable. What are you thinking? A guy who doesn't exist with an untraceable rifle. Let's say you have a very, very powerful enemy. Okay, so going back to being a fan, so it's the 60th anniversary yeah. of General Hospital. Take me back to young Steven. Yeah. Do you remember watching it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we, I go back as far as Luke and Laura. Me too. Uh, the Cassidines, uh, uh, Frank Smith and the Weather Machine, uh, Bobby's boyfriend, uh, Rob, if I remember, getting shot in the elevator when it was supposed to be Luke Spencer. Weren't you supposed uh, to be in school? That's, yeah, I was. But you know what? <laughs> this is the thing. When you came home from school, General yeah. Hospital came. One Life to Live was on. Right. And that led into General Hospital. It was all my children, then yeah. One Life to Live, and I was in school for those yeah. and then I came home and right when I you know I get out at three o'clock but I worked went to school right around the corner and now yeah. here you are a character brick yes. on this when do you have time to rehearse uh there's not much time to rehearse they send me the lines a couple of days before uh I take a couple of days a couple before? of days and I memorize those lines sometimes the night before and I'm ready to go better get this locked away You can find your own way back. Oh, words of advice if you want to stay in this business. Outside of Sonny, trust nobody. Not even you? 
Especially not me. And I remember my first, you know, the first time I did, I had a few lines. Mm -hmm. The second time, they gave me about 20 lines. The third time, I did like six different scenes. And I said, whoa. And I remember one, I, got, I forgot one line, I forgot a couple of lines in one scene. And I held up the entire cast because, you know, you tape it and stuff like that. You got to do it over. And from that day forward, I was like, I don't mess around. Yeah. I, I make sure the first order of business is for me to make sure I know my lines. Method Man was on the show and he was talking about being on Oz and mm -hmm. getting fired from Oz because yeah. he didn't realize the work that it took to rehearse and know the lines. And he came in one day on set and they said, bye. Mm -hmm. We don't care who well, you are. You can't marry yourself to the character if you don't know your lines. Mm -hmm. And But more importantly than that, as hard and as difficult as it may be for some compared to others to memorize those lines, it's also an indication about how serious you take the work. Yeah. Because when you don't know something, if you are a decent human being that cares about other people around you, you it hurts you to hold them up. It hurts you to derail their momentum, their rhythm, and the kind of things that come with it. And that's why I really, really take it so seriously. It's not just because you're on television and you wanna, you wanna put forth a good showing. It's because this is their livelihood. Mm. They care so much. And for you to walk up in there, you need to care every bit as much about them as you do about yourself. And that's exactly how I embrace it. I love it. You know what? When you had your memoir out and really giving the audience a glimpse into why you are who you are right now. Yeah. I always think about you when I think of the Alexander Hamilton uh, musical, mm -hmm. like this guy who's scared to run out of time, mm -hmm. that you want to make sure that you don't leave anything on the table. You compare being on General Hospital to being a kicker, though, in football. <laughs> the interview, you said the football players are out there playing their butts off for 60 minutes, and then the kicker comes in and misses. A, you're not missing, though. I'm not trying you're, to miss. You're not missing. I'm not trying to miss, you know, and, and I've been blessed and fortunate because I do scenes primarily with the star yeah. of the show. And we've we've developed a, a, an incredible friendship, Maurice Bernard and myself. And who is a phenomenal uh, human being, without question, like you, just without like question. You. Thank you so much. And I can't tell you the amount of times that he's pulled me to the side, yeah. and he sat down with me, and he's embraced it, and he's like, "Here's where I want you to go." I remember um, there was a scene where he had lost a relative. And literally, he said to me, I don't want to offend you here. And he, taught, and he brought up losing my mother in 2017. And he said, I need you to go back to that moment. Mm. I need you to embrace how you were feeling at that moment in time. He said, I'm only coming to you because I know you can. I know you can. And I need you to do it. And that's exactly what I did. You know, going back to your mom and your background mm -hmm. and how you were raised, um, another interview you did, Vanity Fair, yeah. and you said, I couldn't rap, I wasn't a good enough basketball player, I wasn't a good enough athlete or an artist where thousands of people are packing in an arena to watch me, but I learned to read and write and comprehend, and I scratched, not clawed, I worked my ass off. Mm -hmm. This is another example of that. Well, that to me is my life. It's like no one's going to outwork me. Nobody. I remember I was just with my boss the other day, and... You know, I was reminded of a time where there was a former executive VP at ESPN who's now the athletic director at Syracuse. His name is John Wildtack, and he introduced me to the football team because he wanted me to speak to the football team. Mm. And he reminded them that he had been in our business for nearly 40 years. Wow. And I was the, I was the only employee he ever had to make take vacation. Make take Are you still that guy now? Because I, you got I, the girls, I, I, I you got I family. I wouldn't go that far. You don't have to make me take vacation now. <laughs> what I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take vacation, but longevity, yeah. thinking about smelling the roses. I'm not one that wants to sit around and smell it, but I want to do things and associate myself with things that allows me to know that I'm reaping the fruits of my labor. You said roses. Tease me up to this part of your memoir, Straight Shooter, where you said, folks will say, smell the roses, bro. You've done it. My answer is, I'm not finished at all. I'm just getting started. That's right. Good luck trying to stop me now. Some folks are going to need to move over because here the hell I come. That's how I close it. How do you balance that from the guy now who wants to take a vacation, enjoy the family, enjoy the, the, the benefits and the perks because, of now being Stephen A. Smith? Because regardless of the vacations that I take or the time that I take off, I'm still going to outwork 99% of the people out there. I don't stop. I'm a machine.
and I know it, and I'm proud of it. And I, and I don't believe that talent is what got me here. It's a commitment to working hard and exhausting myself trying to be and striving to be the best that I can be. And more importantly than that, it really comes down to, you know, being brilliant because you know you're not.